Amazon wants to control your living room. A small town library stands up to the Department of Homeland Security, and we explore a game that is anything but fun. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 426 for Thursday, September 17th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a low-cost automated investment service that is the most sophisticated way for you to invest your money. So whether you've got millions or you're just starting out, visit Wealthfront.com slash TN2 to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. That's Wealthfront.com slash TN2. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Let's get to the tech news. Look out, Apple, Amazon just announced a new Fire TV that makes your demo of Crossy Road look just a little bit lame. The new TV from Amazon offers 4K Ultra HD support for video and integrates the features of the cloud-based virtual assistant built into the Amazon Echo. I will not say her name or she will start obeying my commands in your house. Right now, the Fire TV set-top box will allow you to check the weather, look up sports scores, and play music, but Amazon said you'll be be able to use it it's soon to look up specific TV episodes, regulate the temperature in your house, and dim the lights and control other home appliances through the TV. And of course, pretty soon you'll be able to use it to reorder stuff through your television. You'll need a 4K UHD TV and a pretty robust bro broadband connection to take advantage of the 4K features, but at $99, the Fire TV is less expensive than the just announced Apple TV, but more expensive than Chromecast, Roku 3, or Amazon's new Fire stick with voice search and voice control that's only $40. There is some good news for Apple fans today. While you were busy playing around with all the new features of iOS 9, a federal appeals court ruled that Apple was entitled to an injunction barring Samsung from using certain features that the court said violated Apple's patents. This four-year-old fight has been a lot of back and forth, but the newest win for Apple means Samsung would be prevented from selling phones that use slide to unlock autocorrect, and quick link features. Now, the last phone to include most of these features was the Samsung Galaxy S3. The newest Galaxy, the S6, is not affected. Last week, we told you that a U.S. library had taken down a Tor relay due to pressure from the police and Homeland Security. Today, Ars Technica said the Tor relay has been restored. To recap, it's not illegal to use a Tor browser. In fact, it was originally implemented and deployed by the United States Naval Research Library laboratory. However, the anonymous browser can be attractive to justice seekers and criminal enterprises alike. In a statement, Homeland Security said it does not make policy decisions for local communities, but it will continue to pursue individuals who seek to use Tor to further illicit activity. Coming up, what would you do if you could be invisible in a puzzle game that should not be compared to Myst? But first, you know you should be investing your money for the long term, and you've probably wondered how you should do it. Trying to do it yourself, especially the right way, is complex and time-consuming. Luckily, there's Wealthfront. Traditional advisors charge huge fees, between 1% and 3% of what you've got under management, plus hidden fees for transactions and changes. Wealthfront makes it easy for anyone to access world-class, long-term investment management. You can get started investing today at a minimum of $500. You sign up for an account at Wealthfront.com, and in just minutes, it goes right to work, monitoring your portfolios around the clock, and taking action as soon as an opportunity arises. Wealthfront software optimizes your investments for the best risk-adjusted return net of taxes and fees. Wealthfront is transparent and accessible. You can view all your accounts in one place, whether they're personal, joint, or retirement. You can also see every trade that Wealthfront makes on your behalf, in your dashboard, on your desktop, or with their mobile app. Wealthfront manages over $2.6 billion in client assets, and it's grown over 20 times in the past two years. Visit Wealthfront.com slash TN2 to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. You'll see the customized allocation they recommend for your profile. And just for Twit listeners, if you sign up to invest, Wealthfront will manage your first $15,000 entirely free of charge for life. So claim your offer today at Wealthfront.com slash TN2. 
For compliance purposes, I have to tell you that Wealthfront Incorporated is an SEC registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are offered through Wealthfront Brokerage Corporation, member FINRA and SIPC. This is not a solicitation to buy or sell securities. Investing in securities involves risk and there is a possibility of losing money. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Please visit Wealthfront.com to read their full disclosure. Seven years ago, game designer Jonathan Blow launched his first self-produced game called Braid, which our guest today describes as an out-of-nowhere combination of accessible, familiar elements, trippy gameplay twists, and surprising heart that changed how people make, talk about, and consume the medium. Joining us to talk about Blow's newest puzzle game, which was released today, is Sam Moscovich from Ars Technica. Welcome, Sam. That's good to see you, Megan. You've got my name perfectly oh, this time. I think okay. we're, on a, we're on a roll here. I love okay. it. Good. So now, The Witness is a game that's been said to be difficult to explain without sounding crazy. Um, can you give it a try anyway? Oof. Well, I love sounding crazy, but this is a fun one. Uh, the Witness, if you look at it, they've. Um, this is a game that's been sort of percolating in the indie game sphere for years um, because its creator, after making Braid, thought, oh, he would get this done pretty quickly, showing off um, an island that looks like Mist. And it's an island that you wander around and solve puzzles. So, again, kind of like Myst. Uh, what's really unfolded over the years, though, is a game that is really intense. The kind of puzzle game where it starts out very simply, where you get to solve a couple of little quick puzzles that have lines. You know, you start at a dot, you end at the other dot, and you use a joystick or eventually on an iPad your finger to guide from the beginning to the end. Uh, sometimes it's very simple, uh, one dot at the beginning, one dot at the end, like a normal little children's line puzzle, but eventually you'll run on a puzzle that, say, has six beginnings and six endings. And you'll think, how the, how the heck do I complete this line? Uh, and what the game ends up doing is using its world, its island, its very lush, beautiful island, to make you answer each of these puzzles and to remember stuff from past puzzles to build onto the future puzzles. It's the most cumulative video game I've ever played. Instead of an inventory system like in other adventures, for example, you're an Indiana Jones type and you get your keys and you get your candles and all these things. In this game, you really do have an inventory that's mostly knowledge, where different signals uh, from different parts um, of the game tip you off and lead you different parts of the island uh, and one you end up finding is very weird and very beautiful. This trailer shows a lot of very different environments and sort of teases at the kind of ways that these line puzzles, you'll see the, the, the screens that have been popping up on this where the lines sort of uh, are glowing and you try to fill them out. So um, is this really, like trailers are sometimes not actual gameplay. Is this what gameplay looks like or is it more of just a movie trailer type? Trailer? This is 100% gameplay. Uh, what's very interesting about this preview event, it's not really a preview event I was invited to. Um, John actually sent me the full, mostly finished game. He just gave me the digital download. He said he'd only send it to a few other people at this point and said, here, have a couple of weeks with it and then come visit me at my uh, home in San Francisco and we'll talk about it. And so I've actually put about ooh, 32 hours into this game. Um, and what's shown in that trailer is just the tip of the iceberg for the kind of content that's in there. But it looks just like that. It runs just as smoothly. Um, it is wonderfully, memorably interesting kind of place to explore. So I know not, it's not available yet, uh, but when it is going to be available, where would we be able to play it? Yeah, they announced today was the, the reason I was invited to try it out was because today was the big reveal that it is actually coming out January 26th, 2016. It's going to be, I believe, digital download only. No disc, no box. You can either use your computer, your Windows computer, or a PlayStation 4, and then log in and pay to download it. They have not announced a price or any other specific details like that, but uh, that that is when, where, and how for now. And uh, no information about an iPad or iOS version has yet been confirmed, but it's definitely coming. That'll be the next thing. And as you play, all those little line puzzles and all the, the way that they resemble little iPads in the world makes it sort of obvious that the game has been built from the beginning to be a touchscreen game. So if you wait for that one, I'm sure it'll also be pretty cool. Right. Well, it seems important not to call it mist because it seems different, but it also looks a little bit like Monument Valley, like a very fleshed out, elaborate, detailed Monument Valley. Yeah. I managed to play in 2011 a version of the game that was mostly wireframe. It was solid colors, uh, pretty ugly, uh, 
you, you could see the puzzles and you could wander around and there were other, uh, explaining what I was able to see that early on would spoil some of the really cool stuff. But John Blow prides himself on making his own engine for the game, his own 3D look. And as a result, there's a lot of visual tricks that uh, change how the puzzles play and how you solve them. That was already in the game early on. Um, he wound up reaching out to a team of architects. He said he actually worked with seven architects in all. It sounds like it was a range of friends who worked for cheap and professionals who he could pay to build all these different parts of the world. And he also talked uh, about, he was very interested in making this game look different than other games. Instead, the idea was that he would put effects onto the walls that looked like weathered textures. So when you walked up really closely to things in the game, you'd see sort of weathered effects and destruction effects. This, what you see and what I've talked about is this sort of isolated, abandoned island, uh, and there's no real explanation as to why that's the case. So it's really interesting to see that sort of wear and tear, these little bits of proof of humanity and of chaos uh, that, that exist. And, and the, the look is really, the trailer gives a hint of that, but there is definitely something to be said. Also about Monument Valley, about perspective. There's definitely stuff about perspective that plays into how you play the game. The Real quick, he made a real big deal in a really dorky way that most people probably wouldn't. He said, I wanted the view distance to be huge. So when you play this game, you can see all the way to the end of the island. And you would think, okay, well, I mean, that's kind of nice. I don't mind it being blurry in the distance. But he said that that was a really important thing. And when you play the game, you'll understand why you want to see, at some points, every single thing on the island at any point, as opposed to stuff like getting chopped out to make your computer run faster. You also said it was really important for him that uh, it be a smart game, um, that he said he hates games that manipulate you or that lack respect for the player. Like, he doesn't want... To, he hates games that make that are designed to make people feel like they're smart. He wants the people playing to be smart. Uh, it sounded a little bit elitist, I think. Um, what did you think about that? I, I absolutely agree. I think that he, to some extent, is saying things that most game designers don't, which is that he wants to demand a lot from a player, force them into a perhaps uncomfortable situation, which makes them really explore everything he made in the game. Uh, so I can understand why he did that. I think that's going to be probably the biggest turnoff um, because the game, for one, has no instructions, you get a couple little on-screen prompts and simple puzzles to start you out. So you do the, the very, very basic lines. Start here and there. Boom. Easy. And you get a couple more simple ones like that. But the game actually originally came with um, explanations by the way of little cassettes. You'd walk up to these little tape recorders, tap a button, and they'd play this very specific voiced thing about what you're going to do and what to expect and a mix of these um, instructional things and autobiographical passages. John Blow going on about his childhood, about um, schoolyard issues and things like that. And that was in the version I played in 2011. This year's version, that's gone. And he made it really clear that he's... He, the, making the game was therapy. And he think I think what he decided was he wanted a game that really took that much exploring and that much subtlety because he, in his life, Again, you'll never hear game designers say things like this regularly, that subtlety was a thing in his personal philosophical life that he wanted to reflect in the game. Uh, you, you don't hear about that from Call of Duty or Halo or things, but in The Witness, that really figures into it. And at first, it is off-putting, and by the end, it, it makes sense, it fits, and it fits into either what you will consider beautiful or pretentious, or perhaps both. Well, um, you do sometimes hear uh, female gamers say things like that. Female game designers say things like that, and then you get Gamergate as a result, <laughs> almost. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that that is, you know, the the feeling side of gaming and game design is really interesting, and it, you know, it's obviously a touchstone. It's created a lot of controversy. Um, what is a game? What's not a game? Uh, it's it's interesting. You have a great profile of Jonathan Blow. I mean, he's you know he's he was he's 43. Um, you know, he graduated from college in 1995 or didn't graduate, I guess, from Berkeley. Left Berkeley in '94. Um, kind of rolled around a little bit. Um, and he seems. Uh, I mean, you describe him as just very dark, and the game is a really reflection of his personality. Um, do you see that a lot in game developers? I know recently in the news, Marcus Person, uh, who developed Minecraft, was in the news because he had like a tweet storm about how rich and sad he was. Um, and so, it, and then of course he came back and said, you know, I just, I'm not really sad. I appreciate the money I have, but do you see that a lot in game developers, just a kind of overall um, depression? Well, I think what you said um, about more people making games uh, these days, you are getting more diverse voices now than you were when John Blow was making. When he started The Witness, he was sort of 
in a point of depression that was alleviated by making a lot of money with Braid, which is the game you showed earlier. Um, he talked about, and you see that a lot when someone is making a project that's sort of all by themselves, that's very confessional, and trying to make a confessional experience also fun to play as a game. Not everything works as a game. Just because something uh, is really touching, really personal, doesn't mean tapping a button to get through it is necessarily the right way. And there's a lot of exploration by smaller team game makers about themselves. Um, there's another game that uh, John talked about we didn't get in the, in the feature. Everybody's Gone to the Rapture is uh, another game on PlayStation 4 uh, in which uh, it's very little active gameplay. You wander around, you activate stories. Um, and he talked about that sort of attempt to make a narrative a thing to discover that's not necessarily laid out perfectly for the player and about that sort of depression and how that reflects what the, the depression a game maker has or a reflection on loss. Uh, it, what I mean to say is there's just more of that now than there was back in 2008 when John started making this game, when he had a chip on his shoulder about making things differently, when commenters on blogs were more likely to say this was pretentious or silly than he was to show up to at, you know, conventions nowadays the indie booths, the experimental booths are huge. A game like That Dragon Cancer, which is coming out next year, which is about the creator having uh, his son suffer from cancer, um, that's a, that is the ecosystem now. That is not just this weird tiny thing. It's certainly not the mainstream, but same with movies, same with music, same with books. Video games have found a way to make these games exist, thrive, reach an audience. They're more playable. There's more ways to play them, whether they're on phones or whether they're on cheaper computers, um, and that's just going to keep on growing. The more access there is, um, the more that game makers explore how to make these sorts of games without them being really hard to play, uh, the more that's going to flourish. And The Witness is as simple as possible. You walk, you press a button, and you manipulate little tiny puzzles. In terms of the learning curve, there's not much there. You can just pick it up and pretty quickly learn the system. In fact, uh, one thing most of these reviews haven't said is the game comes with a mist style control mode. You could just use a mouse or your finger to simply warp around. You don't even have to manage walking in first person. So if you know someone who doesn't like that first person walking thing in games, you can still get into the witness and get into the very strange, emotional, intelligent, hard to play stuff. Well, Sam, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to have your uh, view on the latest game. And this one uh, is announced today, but like we said, will not be out till January. Mm -hmm. uh, but for sure it will be out. That's the announcement today, right? It will be out. I will be going on and on and on about it. This is exactly the kind of game that I think is going to change the conversation that people have about games. Not like going to change what we ever, everything before it, but it's going to move the conversation forward uh, in a way between how it annoys people and how it enthralls people and, and maybe both at the same time. So I'm excited. People should look forward to it. And Megan, thank you again for letting me babble on and on about this game. I've been thinking about it for years, so I'm glad to finally talk about it. Well, Sam Muscovich is the culture reporter at Ars Technica. He is at Sam Red on Twitter. Thanks so much for joining us. See you guys soon. Bye. Take care. And finally, tonight, an article in Popular Mechanics says we're one step closer to a real-life invisibility cloak. A breakthrough today comes in the form of a cloak-like nanomaterial that reflects light to create the illusion that a bulky object is flat. The skin-like material is 1,000 times thinner than a human hair. It includes a forest of tiny antennas made of gold bricks that can be printed onto whatever objects need to be concealed. Results of this research were published today in the journal Science. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can find all the ways to subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.